Hello and welcome to this ICME Global Awards webinar. My name is Matt Stalker and I'm your host for today's presentation. The ICME Global Awards celebrate chemical, process and biochemical engineering excellence and are widely recognised as the world's most prestigious chemical engineering awards. Today we'll be announcing the winner of the ICME 2020 Innovative Product Award sponsored by Dusan Babcock. This award recognises the best project, process or product from the chemical and process industries. But first, I'd like to welcome our sponsor, Dusan Babcock's Head of Business Development, Process and Energy, David Irving. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm conscious that the name Dusan Babcock will be better known to, to some of you than others. Uh, those of my vintage may remember the name Babcock and Wilcox, created over 120 years ago probably best known for developing steam generation plant or, or boiler plant to you and I. So that's us, that's the same company. And after a couple of changes of ownership, we've been part of the South Korean conglomerate Doosan Group for nearly 15 years now. Nowadays, we do maintain a market share to service our customers' heat and power needs, both for electricity generation into the grid and industrial applications. And we also continue to have considerable nuclear interests, but a significant amount of diversification has taken place through a combination of organic growth and acquisitions. That's led us to the point where we provide multidisciplinary engineering solutions, project delivery on new build projects, as well as upgrades and rehabilitation on established assets. And on those, we also offer long-term service agreements where we undertake turnarounds, outages, maintenance and repair services, life assessment, life extension programs, and performance improvement initiatives. Our customers nowadays range from operators of manufacturing and process plants in sectors such as hydrocarbons, chemicals, life sciences, and industrial manufacturing through to product developers seeking a partner to validate and commercialize their designs. We have a team of industry experts involved in providing technical consultancy and very specialist services, as well as a range of test facilities at our Renfrew site near Glasgow, which is where I'm based. Uh, the growing world of energy transition is also of interest to us, incorporating decarbonization and net zero carbon coupled with the emerging hydrogen economy. So our background in emissions reduction and air quality control processes should stand us in good stead there from concept through to full project delivery. There is information uh, on our website about our capabilities, but truth be told, it doesn't really do justice to the range of what we do. So best to give us a call if you want to know more or if you have a particular interest. There's no doubt that developing Dusan Babcock into the diverse, flexible, flexible, versatile organization that we've become has been facilitated by our ability to either develop or adopt innovative solutions. It's therefore most appropriate that we sponsor this particular innovative product award because we recognize the key part that innovation plays in our ability to continually improve our services, our services to meet client requirements. For us, innovation can be applied in many ways. It can certainly include the kind of product developments that will have featured in the nominations for today's award, culminating in the shortlist and winner due to be announced later. But for us, innovative thinking can be applied throughout all phases of a project, ranging from the application of advanced technologies or materials through to developing novel techniques and ways of working that result in our construction activities being more efficient or safer or beneficial in any way that protects the project cost, schedule, quality assurance and risk. So innovation really is at the heart of our business. I'd like to say a word about the current situation we find ourselves in, which has resulted in the need for this event to be in the online webinar format. I'm sure, like myself, you'd rather be in our grand ballroom enjoying the company of colleagues, guests and peers. We're all relying on the innovative abilities of the pharmaceutical sector to develop a vaccine. And I'm sure you would join me in wishing those specialists every success in achieving that goal. It really can't come soon enough. 
So finally, I'd like to say thanks to the Institution of Chemical Engineers for organising this event and to all of those participating. Here's hoping we can have a more conventional format this time next year. It's an honour for Dusan Babcock to be the sponsor of this award and the best of luck to all those shortlisted. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you for listening. Thank you, David, and a big thank you to Dusan Babcock for its sponsorship. So without further ado, here are our finalists. We have Dow Consumer Solutions R&D, Dow Europe, Impact Recycling, Johnson Mathey, a joint entry from the National Nuclear Laboratory at the University of Leicester, a joint entry from North Carolina State University, Boston University and Craton Corporation, Petronas Research and Plastic Energy. All of our finalists have been invited to join us today and give a short presentation on their work and subject to time we'll also be inviting you to take part in Q&A. You can submit your questions via the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. We're also live tweeting throughout all of our ICME Awards webinars. You can get involved there using the hashtag ICME Awards. With that in mind, please welcome our first presenter, representing Dow Consumer Solutions R&D. It's Dae Yong Kim. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, well, nice to meet you. This is Dwight Kim from the Consumer Solutions R&D. Today, I'm going to share brief information of our innovative product for ICME Award with my co-workers, JYU and Jay Shipa. Let me start from object and aim over Tau Stereo V2003 UV. As you see in left picture, future trend of automotive display is integrated with large display. You can see in red button here. And as you see in here, it needs auto, 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 autonomous driving and electric vehicles. In right side, you can see Exploded view of automotive display. In here, Tau CV2003 UV forms the seal between the liquid crystal module and, and the cover window. And this UV cover, SI based OCR, provides a resilient and also optical transparent attachment that will last for years. This is supplementary information how product operate. For, chem for pure chemistry, Tau CV2003 UV employs a UV initiated radical reaction. With UV light, photo radical initiator decomposes. A propagation reaction leads to a three dimensional cross linking network and ultimately upload a cured elastomer. For schematic assembly process for fabricating display modules, Tau CV2003 UV is dispensed on the on substrate followed by laminating lamination by copper glass. Then, as you see in this figure, a UV light is used to initiate a curing reaction. Radiation is from the top surface of copper glass, which are there the copper glass and liquid crystal module. In here, oh, I shared with you about, about display. In here, I want to share typical reliability requirement of OCR intake. You can see information in this table. In the left side, for consumer display, target application is cell phone, monitor, and TV. And as you see in this test item, it's relatively 
light condition by comparing with automotive display in light in this table. For automotive display in addition to harsh requirement, high temperature, and increased lead time and size, require Guinness the light stability either. And with this limited requirement for automotive display, acrylic wash cells are not on shoot are on shoot to automotive display due to failure mode in yellowing, delamination, and hazy when exposed to harsh conditions. This is especially light stability check result with the Custom tab. When when you compare with acrylic based OCI product A, B, C, there is a noticeable increase in yellowing value, B value. You can see grep in left side. And moreover, as you see in that picture, a severe yellowing at the edge was observed with the product. And with this oh, light stability check result, we can see the Tau Steel V2003 UV design to endure harsh reliability condition and it verified with this light stability test. Let me also share about sustainability of our product. Tau C V2003 UV is environmentally friendly product. It contains silicon polymer and photo initiator without any additive. This volatile solvent pre formulation contributed to our cleaner environment. In the work process, especially in our customer site, for cleaning step, with lower shear modulus than acrylic wood shell, because the failure rate in display panel rework about 50%, and it allowing to waste only a few displays. Also, with the long-term reliability of our product, V2003 UV, enabling the display modules to last for life of cars, even in the harsh condition. This is the last slide. Tau V2003 UV allows fabricating of high-quality display modules that require long-term reliability in harsh conditions. Moreover, the unique UV blocking capability to protect the display components against the UV light provides a reliable and durable automotive display. Tau V2003 is the first solution to provide improved manufacturability with superior performance in the finished flat panel display for outdoor and automotive use. Thank you for giving me a chance to present our innovative product, V2003, from Tao Consumer Solution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's now time for questions. So if you have a question, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Well, I'll give you a moment on that. Don't forget that this is one in a series of ICME Global Award webinars taking place throughout November. There's still plenty more still to come this month. So if you'd like to know what else is still to come, they're all free to attend, open to all. Please visit icame.org forward slash global awards. Right, we don't appear to have any questions. So thank you. We'll move on to our next presenter. Our next finalist representing Dow Europe is Peter Sandkula. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Hopefully you can also see me in a minute. In a minute. Yeah, we can see you too. Okay, so let me pull up the presentation here. Um, so I hope the presentation is clear. I should be showing my um, the first slide with the, with the introduction. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, um, a lot of plastic weight, waste occupies um, 
the Europe or European and, and global mindsets. We don't want plastic waste to end up in the ocean. So one of the ways how we can make this happen is by um, by making sure plastic waste um, coming from household and different other sources is actually recycled. And one of the projects that we were setting out, which we um, proposed here for this award, is um, the one that you're seeing on this slide here, where we have been developing with, with several partners um, an adhesive-free, polyurethane adhesive-free, print-protected, polyethylene-rich um, stand-up pouch for detergent dishwasher taps that you can use in your in your dishwashers. Um, this package is, as you probably know, a relatively famous brand. Um, and, and we have been um, very grateful to be able to collaborate with Record Bank Kieser and one of our customers, Drukpol, on this project to be able to develop um, more recyclable packaging, which then in the end will allow to make overall packaging re circular and bringing it back to the stream um, as, a, as a new material that can be used again, which with most of current structures on the primary packaging market um, that you find in supermarkets is not very easy today. So the objective from the beginning in this project was to develop a system that would have the maximum recyclability when it's coming from the consumers back into the, through the waste stream, um, through sorting plants back into the market for recyclates that can be used in applications, in packaging applications again. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the, the concept here. Um, a typical um, structure that you can find in the market is the one that you see on the left-hand side in the middle um, of a polyester printed film, a very thin one that is um, adhesively laminated to an um, a polyethylene film, which would be a sealant film for closing packages. Um, and this is a very common structure today in the market for a lot of packaging. And the inventive step or the idea behind the concept that we have been developing is that we would replace this outer layer um, with a layer that is extrusion coated um, and, and polyethylene extrusion coated onto the more or less same sealant film. There have been changes in the sealant film as well as you see on the right hand side, but the key invention and the key um, new um, capability that was developed was to use extrusion coating directly onto a printed polyethylene film, which avoids this polyurethane adhesive, which can be a disturbance or a secondary material in the recycling stream, which can deteriorate the quality of the recycling. So in order to have optimal quality of recyclates, you would want ideally to be um, not using this kind of polyurethane adhesive, but that is only possible if you use this extrusion coating technology, which applies a very thin coating onto the top of a printed polyethylene film, thereby avoiding the use of a polyurethane adhesive in between. Um, but still protecting the print on the inner side between these two films in order to make sure that um, that um, there is no scratching or or, or um, yeah, scratching of the print so that this is also of high quality and um, very well protected. And this technology has not been used in this brass in the market um, and, and therefore this was as well um, a, a quite new um, industry setup in with a lot of collaboration along the value chain. Now this slide um, tries to illustrate a bit the, the mechanical or some per performance characteristics of this um, recyclable structure. Um, we are comparing here the incumbent polyester polyethylene structure um, combination with a pure polyethylene um, system that, that has been created with this project. And you see that, that the barrier um, is, is even improved, but that the other parameters like packaging speed, efficiency, the gloss, the, the stiffness, or so the standing ability of the pouch on the shelf, and the openability by easy tear are very well comparing to the incumbent material, which is why this is already commercial in the market. You can buy it in several European countries and has been um, already quite a nice success in the market 
um, and also for, for Racket Bank as a, as a brand owner. And what we wanted to illustrate on this slide is simply some of the um, key elements that, that enable this. Um, we have some materials that we were specifically selecting and developing for this kind of new application and new technology to enable adhesive-free um, packaging, primary packaging, standard pouches, um, and, and ultimately also illustrating that we were using our Pack Studios, which is a collaboration platform that we have established in, in all of our geographies, to be able to bring packaging solutions faster to the market with the partners. And um, one point that I wanted to illustrate as well on this slide is that um, we have also worked on an LCA assessment for this technology in order to make sure um, that the, the, the footprint of the solution, the CO2 protocol and everything else meets the requirements of the future circular packaging market. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. So once again, we will pause for questions. So if you have a question for Peter, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Whilst we wait for questions, now is a good time to thank our volunteer judging panel, led by head judge Keith Batchelor. The judges work tirelessly to review and score every entry across every category, and you can find out more about their work on the iCommy website, iCommy.org forward slash global awards. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions for Peter, so thank you very much. We will move on to our next presentation. Next up, we welcome our third finalist and representing Impact Recycling, it's James Finlayson. Okay, can you see me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is BOSS, that stands for Baffled Oscillation and Separation System. This is our project here at Impact Recycling. So Impact Recycling was set up to commercialize the BOSS technology. Um, I'm the technical director and one of the founders, um, James Finlayson. And BOSS was my project taking it really from a lab scale technology through to the commercial scale that we see today. Before I get into what BOSS is and what works, I'd like to look at a couple of pictures. This is essentially a pile of plastic. And I'd like to think about how we get from this pile of plastic to these pictures here which are essentially pictures of high value consumer ready products, the left being a HDPE bottle that some of you might be familiar with. And on the right hand side, these are um, panels for a coffee machine and, what, and that's polypropylene, not polyethylene. So from this to this, and really I'd like to highlight the three innovations that I see that have really made this possible. So the first innovation is BOSS. What is BOSS? Well, BOSS stands for Baffled Oscillation Separation System. As a quick overview, it's a scalable automated water-based uh, separation solution for mixed plastics. Um, it's completely color agnostic, meaning that all plastics that go in can be separated based upon their apparent density. This means that all black plastic can be recycled uh, as well as other colors. Um, BOSS separates the hard to recycle mixed rigid waste plastic. So essentially what we were looking at in that picture before was the pile that has been left behind after easy to recycle, easy to identify by their shape, uh, plastics have been removed. We really are going after the, the mix of plastics that's there. And the only way that we can separate them at scale is by density. Um, our system's unique in that it only uses water to achieve that density separation. And that in itself is quite special because 70% of the plastics that were in that pile were polyolefins, polyethylene, polypropylene, two commodity plastics. They both float in water. So being able to separate them using only water is in itself quite innovative. Um, we use the flow patterns that we create in our BOSS system to essentially exploit very small differences in the density and the drag of, sus of suspended particles. And the outcome of this is to greatly amplify the differences in both positive and negative buoyant forces. So if we have a little look at what BOSS can do, um, so this is our BOSS system. We take in the mixed post-consumer plastic, including black plastic from both the, the public at, at your bring centers, but also from waste management companies. Like I say, this is a pile that's been uh, previously being exported, incinerated or landfilled. So we're adding new recycling capacity with our BOSS process. Putting it into BOSS, we produce two 98 
100% pure post-consumer PP and PE resins. And these are of a purity that are, is high enough to go straight to brands, back into remanufacturing, or indeed to feed the chemical recycling technologies. What is really unique about our boss system is that yes, it can create the 98% pure PP, but we can also guarantee what the other 2% uh, impurity is. It's always the other polyolefin. The way it works, anything that escapes from BOSS has to be a polyolefin, and we're able to separate the poly polyolefins themselves into PP and PE. So a quick look under the hood. It's a very, very simple machine. We have plates, almost like bubble plates in a distillation column, arranged in a stack. So between each plate, you have a stage. Now, these, these, um, this stack is submerged in water, and it oscillates up and down. When it oscillates up and down, the water is forced to flow through these holes that you see in the plates. And this creates vortices, vortexes, which um, trap the polypropylene and allow the polyethylene to escape through. So essentially we are changing the um, residence time of one suspended particle relative to another. And this allows us to drive a separation and achieve really good purities on, in polypropylene, polyethylene and other uh, materials. The, the, the uh, experiments that we've done have shown us being able to split particles based upon an apparent density delta of 0 0.01 gram per centimeter cube. So this allows us to separate polypropylene, even filled polypropylene from medium density polyethylene, as well as some low density polyethylenes. But the main one is HDP and we're separating PP from HDP. In addition to the polypropylene and polyethylene, which get washed through the stack and separated, any residual non-polyolefin fractions, typically with a, a density greater than one, heavier than water, sink through the stack. And we essentially end up with three streams. A light stream, which is our polypropylene, a medium stream, which is our polyethylene, and a heavy stream, which can be, for example, PET. And this is what we originally looked at using BOSS for. It was to plug into PET recycling, bottle, water bottle recycling plants, where when they chop off the lids, they're left with a 10% PET, 50% PE, and the residual being polypropylene mix of polymers. By putting it into our BOSS system, you'd end up with a pure PP, pure PE, pure PET. And this is what we originally thought this innovation could be applied to. But we actually thought we could do a bit more than that. And this is the second innovation I'd like to talk about, which is our actual business model, the impact recycling business model, as well as the process. So rather than going after caps just for bottles, so one item and separating them out, we realized we could go after this pile here, which is the pile, as I said, that's left behind after the choice plastics have been removed and recovered, or the easy to sort optically plastics have been recovered. And all of this feedstock was previously landfilled, incinerated, or exported. And in the latter case, when it's exported, it inevitably ends up in the sea. So we are actually going after new recycling feedstock. We're adding new recycling capacity, not competing for existing um, collected plastic. But to do that, we actually have to develop a whole process beforehand, a whole wash process to feed our boss process, and then afterwards, a drying and de-dusting process. So these are the, the innovations that we've, we've come up with really to, to place our patented BOSS system inside the recycling infrastructure and to do that at, at scale as well and, and really tackle that, that pile of plastic um, that hitherto has been a real problem for recyclers in Europe. So this involved us designing the process but also designing bespoke machinery because quite often the unit operations that we thought the process demanded didn't have an off-the-shelf solution for. Um, I'm going to try and go to a video now and see if it works. This is a fly through of our yard. Is that coming through okay for you guys? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So the drone will maneuver itself through the door and we'll get a look at the process here. So in that yard, like I say, we, we collect bales and loose plastic. It's unsorted. It's as the public is disposing it. And really this is where it enters the, the first stage of our process. It's quite simple. It's a very agricultural process. And what you see here is our first stage shredder. So the material goes into a shredder. Inside here, there is a screen that's 50 millimeters uh, across and this produces a shredded plastic. As it's being transported along here, we can uh, demetal the magnet to remove ferrous metal. 
But essentially what you're seeing here is shredded plastic as it's disposed of um, in the waste infrastructure in the UK. So that includes things like uh, all grades of plastic, PPP, EPT, uh, PVC, but it also contains paper, non-ferrous, grit, sand, stones, you name it, what you put in your bin, it's probably on our site. Um, from there, we enter our wash process. So the, the mix is fed into a, a, a basic tank. This is just water that's in this tank. The floating fraction is conveyed along. And by that point, it's pure poly polyolefin. But you do take out the non polyolefins at this stage, and we take out two distinct fractions. The first fraction is your heaviest non polyolefin, so PET, polycarbonates, heavily filled PVCs. And then the second outlet is actually taking you know, things that sink, but maybe sink slower, like HIPS, ABS, filled PP. So we end up with two technical grades here one that is uh, slightly more contaminated, and one that is manufacturing ready. The floating fraction, however, is then conveyed along up into a knife mill. So inside here, the, the 50 millimeter plastic is chipped down to eight to 12 millimeters. And from there, it's passed into a wash tank. This is a warm wash that uses a surfacent to penetrate any glues or labels that might have been on the plastic, soften them up so that they come off at the next stage, which is drying. And the, the, the clean polyolefin is produced and, and collected here. Now, at this stage, this is no real value. It's 50% is PP, 50% PE. Together, they can only go into low value applications. The, the mechanical properties are actually quite terrible as they are. But then we feed our boss process. So the mix goes into our boss process where the separations occurs. This one is purifying polyethylene. This one's puring, purifying polypropylene. And a 98% pure product comes off. It then goes into a spin drying process before going into a current to current air wash. And this really allows us to produce a manufacturing ready uh, polypropylene or polyethylene regrind here, which is what you can see on the right here. Um, this, we have been selling our products into UK manufacturing now since we set up. Newcastle, that process you see there can do 6,000 tons per year of that, that, that mixed feed in, uh, feedstock as an input. Um, all the polypropylene goes into, you know, good value end products like paint pots, et cetera, packaging. However, it turned out that the polyethylene, although being very pure, um, didn't have the same number of markets that our polypropylene did. So this is where I'd like to introduce the last innovation. When you look at this pile of plastic, yes, it's it's polypropylene, polyethylene, different kinds of plastics. But if you then were to separate 100% pure of the polyethylene, you'd still end up with a mixed molecular weight polyethylene. You'd have some injection grade material, some extrusion grade material. You'd also have rotomolded materials. And all of these materials have different rheologies, which is where we came to our, our, our next problem. Yes, whilst BOSS is vital in unlocking high purity polymers from commingled waste streams and preserving the mechanical properties, the plastic industry itself is actually set up to accept grades based upon a number of processability metrics. How fast does it flow? How, how stiff is it when it flows? And can it take a, a color master batch? Can we recolor the, the plastic? And this has been a real challenge to the scalability of post-consumer recycling. It was potentially even a limiting factor. Yes, we could keep unlocking all this plastic for recycling, but if we didn't have good applications to put it into, the, the economics just didn't stack up. Well. Thinking about that problem, we've developed with our partners, Plastic Science by Design, an FDA approved rheologically dynamic additive for use with post consumer plastic. So, what you're looking at here is our material, which is a range of different molecular weights, all flowing at exactly the same speed under the same temperature and pressure conditions. Normally, when you'd put a recycled grade of plastic in here, these strands would start to break because it would get runnier, it would get stiffer, it would get flimsier depending on what the, the mother um, feedstock molecular weights were. Our additive works without changing the mechanical properties. We don't use peroxides. We don't go in there to change the molecular, molecular weights or the bonding. But what we do is we have a rheologically dynamic additive. It only becomes active under certain temperature and shear parameters. And this is an example of what we can do. So this is our material, that pile of plastic you saw in the yard being used to make very glossy, very high value consumer packaging. So this is post-consumer um, collected 
plastic being turned back into a, a consumer facing product. And um, why this is innovative is that that pile of plastic that we were looking at before had every kind of polyethylene in there. This, these two extruded tubes should be flowing at completely different rates. They should not be consistent. But our additive under the temperatures and pressures that are experienced in that barrel act as a micron layer, which essentially control the no slip condition, the boundary layer. And that allows us to specify how fast that boundary layer shear, uh, shears at, what the flow is. And by controlling that, we are able to make these um, high end products. The way the additive works though, actually allows us to recolor the polymer. And that's maybe a bit disingenuous. We're actually recoloring just the surface of the polymer. The additive occupies that, that micron layer between the, the polymer melt and the processing machine. And because it stays there, it can take on the color. And once, once, it's, um, once we've added white to it, for instance, we can then recolor it any color, including impact blue. This is as close to producing a virgin grade of plastic that we can get to via mechanical recycling. So we've got recolored polypropylene, we've got very nice glossy HDPE. And I like this table here because it shows what the, the, the virgin values were for a top load, which is the, the compression rate of the bottle, uh, are there between sort of 23 and 20, uh, sorry, 27 and 28 kilograms before you see a failure. Our post-consumer resin was getting up at 23, 22, 23 kilograms. The standard is nine. So that really just highlights that by separating with BOSS to a high enough purity, you preserve the mechanical properties of the material. And then with the additive, it allows you to recolor it and flow it into any shape that you want. So these two things combined really help you get that pile of plastic into high value applications. And really, this is just a slide to highlight why this is actually important. Um, the plastic pact was set up between the government, NGOs, brands, and distributors to look at how they can address the challenge of, of, of plastic litter, essentially. And the sort of three targets that they've set is 100% plastic packaging to be reusable, recyclable, or compostable by 2025, 70% of plastic packaging effectively recycled, and by 2025, 30% average recycle content across all plastic packaging. These first two are only achievable with something like BOSS, something that you can separate commingled waste streams out into pure polymer types and not exclude that, you know, 30% of the, the waste flow because it's black or it can't be seen optically. This last one here, this is all the additive. It, you know, we can unlock all the plastic that we want, but unless we can plug directly into existing infrastructure, into existing reforming activities, it's never going to work. So this these sort of four slides here are essentially putting numbers to how we get that to that. But it's not just about litter though. If you look at sustainability in the round, the carbon savings are the real winner when it comes to mechanical recycling. For every ton of mechanically recycled polymer, we displace one ton of virgin polymer and prevent the emissions from incineration and export. So these are some numbers that, we, that we've had in our life cycle analysis. You know, not all chemical recycling is the same, but the, the particular BASF um, solution that we were looking at had 4.2 tons of CO2 per ton of chemically recycled product. Incineration, when you include collection and the fact that you have to bring in more virgin to displace that incinerated polymer is 4.1 tons per ton produced. Mechanical recycling is under half a ton, but with our boss mechanical recycling, by virtue of the fact it has a 30% higher yield than traditional recycling processes and its increased throughput comes down at 0 0.125 ton, uh, kilo, uh, tons of CO2 per ton of recycled product. So that's been a bit of an overview of the journey so far. And I'd just like to highlight what we're gonna be doing next. We're, we're well on with getting boss to work on flexibles, just like the previous speaker spoke about the challenges of having multi-material laminates uh, in a waste stream, we're, we're actually adjusting our system so that we can separate films, flexible plastics, monomaterial and multi-material to, to unlock the circular economy in flexible plastics. We've developed it to work on fishing nets and you know, if it works on fibers, it also works on carpets and clothing. We've also in the process of launching a BOSS system to deal with increased medical waste flows. So, 
the PPE from COVID has really, you know, seen a lot of polypropylene going to incineration that doesn't need to, as well as for technical prop, uh, polymers. And in terms of the rigid recycling, which we're currently doing, we have pressed go on a plant in Groningen on Holland that can do 25,000 tons per year. We are about to sanction a plant in Manchester for the same capacity. And we have licensed the technology to chemical recyclers over in the USC, USA, which is PCT, a spin out of Procter & Gamble. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, James. Once again, we'll pause for questions. So if you have a question for James, please type it into the questions box now. Okay, we have our first question. Uh, how does your PCR ODA compare to traditional mechanically recycled PCR? Sorry, just unmute myself there. Yeah, ODA is a, is a universal problem for mechanical recycling. However, when you successfully remove non-polyolefins and you properly wash the non-plastic fractions off of the polymer, you greatly reduce this odor. 95% of the odor in a, in a recompounded post-consumer resin comes from the reprocessing, the second thermal stage that that plastic goes through, where you char or burn uh, elements that are on the plastic during the, the second compounding step. The additive greatly reduces the, the compounding temperature from say 170 degrees to 130 degrees. And this greatly reduces the amount of VOCs that you produce during that process. Couple that with um, a deodorizing, um, a bit of equipment called a deodorizer essentially, that you can put at the end of a compounding line, which drives off VOCs, including limonene. You can remove as much of the odor as, as possible. It will still have an odor compared to chemically recycled polymer. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's the only question we have, so we'll move on. Thank you, James. It's now time for our next finalist, and this one is from Johnson Matthew. Please welcome Lars C. Anderson. Hello, everyone. Uh, Lars here. Um, yeah, I'm representing uh, Johnson Matthew and uh, our formaldehyde business, and um, I'm uh, localized in the in Sweden, where we have uh, the majority of uh, the people working with with the formaldehyde. But uh, it's a global business, and we have uh, <clears throat> sold catalyst and f uh, production plants for formaldehyde globally for more than 50 for more than 60 years now. So today I'm going to um, talk to you about uh, one of the uh, recent projects we had. We call it high pressure, high productivity formaldehyde production. Um, I also want to say a few words about, um, sorry about that, uh, about uh, Johnson Matthey and our values. So Johnson Matthey's vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for the future generations. We are leaders in sustainable technologies and we apply our science to solve our customers' most complex problems. We work with customers and partners across many different markets, of course. We at Johnson Matthey is using science to tackle mainly three global challenges and that's how we have organized our com company. Uh, one is the need for clean air. Another is the conversation of our planet's natural resources, where probably uh, our project I'm going to present today fits in best. And the third is the requirement for more affordable, increasingly personalized healthcare. We invest in research and development to ensure our science stays cutting edge. Our science has been established over many, many years, and now we have more than 1,600 people working in research and development globally. In JM, we work in partnership with our customers, understanding their problems, stripping complex issues back to the fundamentals, and developing solutions. We establish long-lasting relationships with our customers, which are built on trust and understanding. 
Detailed modeling and understanding of materials and production procedures means we can develop new materials, formulate products and design processes to manufacture specific materials at commercial scale. This creates value for our customers, enabling them to improve the performance of their products, reduce capital requirements, bring products to market faster, reduce their environmental impact, and comply with regulations or legislation. And I think uh, the project I'm going to talk about now is a perfect example of, of uh, many of these things, actually. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with formaldehyde and what that is and how it's used. Uh, it's not a consumer product, so most people doesn't really know what it's used for. Many people are thinking of maybe uh, preserving tissue and uh, uh, old animals and things like that in formaldehyde, but it's much, much more than that, of course. Um, I think one of the important uh, takeaways here is that formaldehyde, producing formaldehyde has been going on for a very long time. So it's a very mature business. You can see here already in 1859, there was a Russian guy who started to he succeeded to produce formaldehyde with a silver acetate catalyst. Uh, also, important to mention is that the raw materials for producing formaldehyde is methanol and, and the oxygen we have in the air. So we partially, partially oxidize methanol with, uh, with, with the oxygen we have in the air over some kind of catalyst. Um, I said before that we have been delivering this process and the technology for more than 60 years. And actually in 1959, uh, we delivered or started the first commercial formaldehyde plant based on the what we call Formox process, where we're using the iron molybdenum oxide catalyst. Here you can also see, uh, let's say, that how the, the formaldehyde business is, is divided. We say normally it's in, in wood, the wood segment and chemical segment. And uh, for the wood segment, there is, of course, um, uh, products you see in your daily life uh, because it's used in, in the construction business, making houses, uh, furniture, etc. So the formaldehyde is used for creating the, the binders for, for different wood materials. Then the other segment is a chemical segment where you can see there is a lot of different type of, of uh, materials, very interesting. Uh, plastic materials, for instance, and textiles, coatings, engineering polymers. So many different um, markets are involved here and we have uh, so many different application areas and that is also why I think this this business is so exciting this slide uh, try to demonstrate how we have led the market uh, through coming up with new innovations and news uh, continuously so what we see here is actually um, the red line or curve. That is uh, the productivity number for the formaldehyde process. This is a relative number, you can say. So in the beginning of the 1960s, you can see we have a productivity number of four. And now with our latest innovations, uh, as this high pressure for Maldive project is, we are up to something like 32. So you can see the step change from 26 to 32 was actually because of this project. I think it, that's um, especially impressive uh, considering that this is a very major business and this um, type of production has been going on for such a long time. The blue curve here is sort of that that's representing the um, capacity we have put on the market with our technology. And as you can see, it's more than 20 million tons of formaldehyde is today uh, being able to be produced with our process. It um, can be interesting also to say then that the, the total market for formaldehyde today is, or the capacity is something like 80 million tons. So we are in, in the lead here, actually. And so it's very important for us to continue to work with new innovations. And that's also why we have built up an excellent center for formaldehyde, for instance, in Sweden, uh, 
uh, where we continuously work with new things. So, getting into this specific project then, uh, what was the market expecting from us? Well, we knew there was a continuous demand from the market to both reduce the capex or investment cost, uh, but also the production costs to, to make the formaldehyde and also to be able to deliver plants of larger capacity. When I showed you the, the slide before with the different type of products, in the chemical segment we now see new applications popping up requiring very very large uh, volumes of uh, formaldehyde so the projects are getting increasingly bigger and we responded to this by uh, doing quite a lot of things um, one was to be able to increase the um, productivity or you can say the capacity from the same size of plant with more than 30 percent which was, of course, uh, made a significant difference for, for the uh, investment cost per ton produced from aldehyde. We also, at the same time, uh, increased the opera operation flexibility, uh, how you can, let's say, play with the, with, the, uh, with the plant. You can operate it at low speed, low output, or high speed, high output and still get very good performance and, and a decent direct variable cost. We succeeded to lower power consumption per ton of product. Um, at the same time, we kept uh, the high standard of the, the Formox pr pr product line. Um, we secured cooling of the reactor. Um, this process generates a lot of heat and uh, since we didn't really increase the size of the plant or the size of the reactor, but we still succeeded to produce 30% more um, product, we also increased the, the heat load with 30%. So we had to do some um, serious uh, development of, of the reactor to, to be able to uh, secure the cooling char characteristics. We also had to uh, do uh, redesign of the incineration system we use. Uh, we purify all the off gases um, from the plant and we had to do this to keep down the size of the equipment but also to, to be able to meet the capex demands. Uh, of course we also applied all the latest knowledge of safety standards and other relevant operating feedback into this new, new uh, design. And uh, I think also it's very important to, to uh, pinpoint here that w the success factor here is also to, to work both with, with the catalyst, which we had to develop a new catalyst to be able to cope with those new operating conditions uh, together with the new plant. So very important um, for us to be able to, to work with both and uh, that's also one of the keys uh, in this project. So, uh, well, I would say, I think, I think this was a remarkable effort. Um, we uh, actually kicked off this project in the spring 2016, um, went on a very quick and hard pace and uh, already one and a half year later we were able to test in full scale uh, the newly developed catalyst in a customer plant in, in Mexico with, with good results. Um, and during this project phase where we have developed um, the new, uh, let's say, technology, both for the catalyst and also at the same time for the plant, we also kept the, the sales guys and, and uh, informed on what's going, what was going on and what was going to come. And uh, they, of course, try to, to um, uh, market the, this new product, uh, even if it was not ready yet, yet, to the market. And there was a big interest. And uh, actually, we, we succeeded to, to sell a commercial license uh, already in June 2018. And then uh, our excellent engineers, they worked with the pros, pro, this project and um, 
uh, in October, November 2019, we actually started the first commercial plant with this new technology. So I think um, you can see I wrote down here the success factors. I think that that's really a good good example of what we can do uh, in JM by working together with with uh, all the skills we have, uh, all the innov innovative people we we have and also, of course, the experience we have of uh, making formaldehyde. And that was really everything I was going to say about this. And of course, if you are interested more about Johnson Matthey and uh, the formaldehyde business or, or Johnson Matthey in, in general, you can always uh, drop me uh, an email or you can go into our webpage and check out what we are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. So if you have a question about what we've just seen, please type away in the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Whilst we wait for questions, if you've been suitably inspired to submit your own entry to next year's ICME Global Awards, keep an eye on our website for entry information. We typically open for entries at the start of March each year. So head over to icame.org forward slash global awards early next year, and you'll be able to read more about our 2021 Global Awards program. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions for Lars, so thank you very much. We will move on to our next finalist, uh, representing the National Nuclear Laboratory and the University of Leicester. It's Tim Tinsley. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, so much for just clicking a few buttons here. Uh, Hopefully that's now full screen for people um, and hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Yes, we can. Good. Um, this is our uh, uh, entry into the Innovation Product Awards. It's um, Okay, we appear to have lost Tim. Um, we'll just give him a moment to get his connection back and see what happens. Uh, if not, we'll move on to our next presenter and come back to Tim. We'll just pause for one moment and see if his connection picks up again. Okay, it looks like we've lost Tim. We will try and get Tim back. So what I'm going to suggest we do is we move on to our next finalist. Uh, sorry to spring this one on you, Richard, straight away. Uh, but representing the North Carolina State University, Boston University and Craton Corporation joint entry, please welcome Richard Spontak. can't hear you yet Richard you will just need to unmute yourself before we start there, there we go how's that perfect thank you very much okay uh, I'm going to uh, get rid of that okay okay good morning everyone uh, from the United States uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, present our uh, research area in terms of an innovative product. This is a collaborative effort between NC State University uh, as well as Craton Corporation and the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories at Boston University. And let me just move this off to the side so you can see everything. So uh, people who have been involved in this product, which deals specifically with self-disinfecting polymer that prevents spreading COVID-19, uh, include Professors Galati and Scholl at NC State, Dr. Vijay Metar at Creighton Corporation, and Professor Anthony Griffiths at Boston University. Uh, 
I'd like to preface this talk by just pointing out our sincere gratitude to the judges for choosing this uh, entry as one of the finalists in this year's ICAMI Global Awards. So let's begin now with with a picture that unfortunately we've all come to know oh so well. And that is a portrayal of how much this pandemic has hurt the, the entire globe, both in terms of healthcare, in terms of economy, in so many ways that we have only now started to actually come to understand. And when we start seeing all these numbers, we think back to what is the cost for all this? Well, it's this little simple virus that has taken the lives of so many. In fact, if we start looking at the track count, and this is as of this morning, we're looking at about 1.3 global deaths around the world, 240,000 in the US, in Europe about 290,000, the two that come in next on the list, Brazil and India, and so many more. In the United Kingdom, it's about 50,000. And I think the really and truly tragic part about just putting numbers like this up on a screen for you all to see is that we forget that there are living people behind each one of these numbers. And these people did not ask for the affliction, perhaps even took measures to try to avoid becoming sick. But nonetheless, cases are rising, hospitalizations are rising, death counts are rising. And so we came, with, we came up with a question of how can we help on a global scale, not just a local scale? Well, of course, using personal protection equipment, such as face masks or face shields or anything that would effectively mitigate the transmission of this virus, SARS-CoV-2, via droplets from uh, exhaled air or aerosols. We could use that and we should use that. We should be attentive to social distancing to ensure that we are protecting others as well as ourselves and our loved ones. Yesterday and today, promising news came out about potential vaccines from Pfizer and Eli Lilly. But we have to ask the question, can we do better? Do we always have to be reactive rather than proactive? And that's what brings me to the innovative product. It's referred to as Biaxum. And this particular material has tremendous versatility and it's incredibly effective. So first of all, what exactly is biaxum? Well, it is what's called in the polymer field, a block polymer due simply to the fact that there are certain blocks of different polymer moieties along the backbone. And what we see here is that there are five. The end blocks are T-butyl styrene. The intermediate block is an ethylene propylene rubber. And the middle block is really the most important one for this application. It's a partially sulfonated styrene block. And so when we start looking at this type of material, the first thing to recognize is that it's actually considered a thermoplastic elastomer. And if you follow any of the, the market trends regarding materials development, you would know that in 2019, thermoplastic elastomers accounted for about $22 billion industry in the United States. If we look at the projection for 2024, now we're looking at about $28 billion. So these types of materials are very important. And the thermoplastic elastomer basically depends on end blocks that are thermoplastic for strength, stability, 
and processing. This intermediate block provides the material with toughness and flexibility, so it's not a brittle material like uh, a polystyrene plastic would be. And this middle block, because it is now partially sulfonated, provides really effective antibacterial and antiviral properties. In this way, this combination of properties is unique and considerably innovative in terms of all the functions that this one molecule can achieve. So biaxum is inherently antimicrobial. And I'll show you in a moment that it is capable of killing SARS-CoV-2. And I will also like to point out that this additive, or not this additive, but this functionalization requires that this uh, chemical compound, this moiety, is chemically attached to the polymer. So it is bound, it cannot come off. And now this combination provides durability, long-lasting effectiveness, and it can be used in conjunction with a wide range of surfaces. Now, this type of material, it sounds very complicated to manufacture, but lo and behold, it can and is manufactured in large quantities. So this is not a material that is produced on the bench scale. This is now into production. So let me give you, first of all, an overview of what is achievable with this biaxum polymer. It can inactivate a wide range of both bacteria, that includes gram-positive, gram-negative, and antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And that includes MRSA, that includes E. coli, and most recently, that includes C. difficile. In addition, it can inactivate uh, several viruses by as much as 99.9999 plus percent. And that is statistically validated. And the time of exposure required is only five minutes. So if we look at the big picture, these are studies that were conducted at NC State using a BSL-2 laboratory. And you can see the variety of different bacteria that have been studied, as well as the viruses, the exposure time and the percent inactivation. But why stop there? Let's go to some independent sources. How about Sinjin in India? Different viruses. We see essentially the same kind of behavior. Our collaborators at Boston University with the BSL four laboratory were able to examine SARS-CoV-2 and to do a time-lapse study and found that after five minutes, 99.99 plus percent was achievable at the limit of detection. And lastly, again, an independent source for determining the effectiveness of this product the University of Texas Medical Branch, and they collaborated what we found at Boston University. So what you are seeing here is overwhelming evidence that this particular type of material is a broad spectrum antimicrobial. It doesn't matter whether we are talking about bacteria, such as those that are responsible for hospital acquired infections, or a pandemic-driven virus that affect, can affect millions of more people uh, over the next few months. What exactly is biaxum? Well, if we take a close look, I mentioned that it's a block, of polymer, block polymer, and in fact, it's a charged block polymer. It has the ability to self-organize, it forms a nanoscale morphology that consists of hydrophilic channels. So imagine that within this thermoplastic elastomer, we ha now have channels through which 
the protons from the sulfonic acid groups can migrate in the presence of water. This is what the morphology of this material looks like. It depends on what type of solvent is used for casting purposes. What you're, see, what you're going to see here are materials that were cast in this form so that you can see that they do have continuous channels. And that is critically important. In addition, if we take the material before immersion in water, we see little evidence of sulfur from sulfonic acid groups at the surface, according to X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. But if we now put it in contact with something like a phosphate buffer saline solution, which contains calcium ions, we can detect not only the calcium ions, but now we can detect the sulfur from the sulfonic acid groups. So they become accessible on the surface, which means that the protons from underlying sulfonic acid groups can get to the surface. What's the outcome? Well, quite frankly, it's amazing because what we start off with are intact virus particles, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 particle. It comes in contact with the surface, but because of the enrichment of protons at the surface, we see a considerable reduction in the surface pH down to below one. That's only at the surface of the material, however, and it doesn't extend very far. And now what happens is this sudden drop in pH is enough to cause deterioration of the virus and it completely destroys it. So that's the underlying mechanism behind this type of material. And as far as we are aware, no other product has been able to follow in this route and has not produced uh, results that are of the same magnitude in terms of efficacy as the Biaxa material has, has proven. What are the advantages? Well, you can see that it can be used in healthcare, for face shields, for dressing gowns on textiles, face masks. It can be used for transportation modes in terms of what we hold on to or touch, or in that regard, touch screens. Or maybe we're looking at transportation in the airline industry or the train industry or the automotive industry. And it doesn't stop there because, of course, we can always think of putting coatings on countertops. So think of the desk that you're sitting behind right now. What if that surface became inherently antimicrobial? Or, of course, filtration systems. And again, common objects that we uh, touch because that is one of the modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2. It is transmissible on what are called fomites, that is contaminated surfaces, and survival of COVID-2 can last on the order of a few days to almost a month on some surfaces. So we see that this is a way to prevent the spread of, of COVID-19. Killing is efficient, five minutes or less. It's non-selective. It doesn't particularly go after a particular chemical moiety on a microbe, which means that the microbes cannot develop resistance to this approach. It's polymer-based. There's no worry about leaching out of nanoparticles. It's transparent and can be used in things like face shields. And it's highly durable because of its thermoplastic elastomer nature. It can be applied in terms of coatings. It can be applied as peel and stick films. And it has good compatibility and adhesion to a wide variety of different surfaces. What else is this particular product useful for? Well, it has high water transmi transmissibility. And that means that it's actually suitable for other technologies as well, lending its inherent antimicrobial activity to these areas of 
commercial interest as well as research interest. For example, clothing where we want to look at trying to transmit perspiration quickly for cooling purposes. Well, now the material can also be antimicrobial. Or what about humidity management through air conditioners? We now can install this antimicrobial material and have it provide a second function to air conditioning. What about water purification? And indeed, it is used for that purpose. Other areas that have proven very promising, electro-responsive materials for robotics, re uh, selective removal of gases from gas mixtures, in this case, removal of ammonia from um, mixture of ammonia and air. And we see that from a biogas separation approach, this provides selectivities on the order of about 1800. It can also be used for organic photovoltaics, providing relatively high current densities on the order of milliamps per square centimeters, efficiencies of about 7%, and a very wide range of applicability in terms of the wavelength spectrum. So, this material, although Right now, I'm only uh, focusing in on antimicrobial activity, has a lot of other promise in terms of what it can bring to our everyday lives. The commercial side of Biaxa. It's manufactured in its base form as a styrenic block polymer. And this is the facility in Ohio where you see these materials. Now, it's important to realize that Craton Corporation is one of the leaders in the world for the production of styrenic block polymers. And to put this in perspective, here are some statistics showing the importance of these types of materials as, as compared to all other thermoplastic elastomers. The styrenic block polymers have led in 2015 and they are predicted to hold on to that lead well into 2023. And so we're talking typically on the order of about 400 to 500 kilotons produced uh, worldwide, or I'm sorry, produced uh, in the US. And it is incredibly fortuitous that Craton Corporation has taken the lead in producing an innovative product such as Biaxum that is capable of now effectively saving lives. The functionalization of the Biaxum occurs uh, with a separate uh, producer that has a very long history with Craton. There are, again, different ways in which the Biaxum can be applied, for example, direct coating onto removable or replaceable peel and stick films. And these can be used in a wide variety of applications ranging from countertops and door handles to touch screens. This polymer can be directly or spray coated onto textiles and filters, such as the face masks that we should all be wearing. And it can also be used as in film form for semi-permanent lamination. Now this is in addition to what this material had been previously designed and used for, which is water filtration. And again, humidity management as well as textile modification. So the antimicrobial aspects and in particular, the anti-SARS-CoV-2 aspects of Biaxin constitutes a uniquely innovative approach to uh, trying to mitigate the pandemic that we are all going through. And this particular product is protected by numerous patents. So it is a material that is going into uh, production worldwide for the purpose of saving lives. 
Before I end, I would like to just point out the individuals who, in addition to those mentioned at the beginning, have been uh, intimately connected with this work uh, from NC State, from Creighton, and from Boston University. Uh, support from this work came from Creighton, Halyard Health, the Non Wovens Institute at NC State, and the Research Triangle Nanotech Network. And I mentioned at the beginning that. Our colleagues at Boston University were the ones who did the time uh, study of SARS-CoV-2. These are those results. And what you see is that at five minutes, we're at the minimum detection limit. That same is true at 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes. So you can get a feel for how effective this material is, especially if you want to compare it to copper, which is a well-known antimicrobial substrate. And this is what has been measured after one hour and after four hours compared to five minutes. And it comes, it's almost an order of magnitude higher than what we're able to achieve with this polymer. So in closing, I would like to again point out that we're not just trying to stop the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in this pandemic. We're here to prevent it. And the way that we can prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2 is by developing materials that are antimicrobial, in particular antiviral, and that have the properties that a material like biaxin does. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I would also like to again point out that we are honored to be selected as one of the finalists in this year's competition. And if you'd like to contact us, please feel free to do so with our contact information at the bottom. And lastly, stay safe. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Richard. So once again, we'll pause for questions. And if you have a question about Richard's work, please type it in now on the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions, so we're going to move on. Thank you, Richard. Um, Thank you. We're going to circle back to Tim Tinsley from the National Nuclear Laboratory in the University of Leicester. We'll try again with Tim, so over to you. Yeah, really sorry about uh, that. Uh, it, my internet took that particular moment to have a, a bit of a blip, um, so I'm not sure how far I got before I realised that. Um, Okay, so I won't do the introduction. Um, I've, space is an uh, incredibly hostile and difficult environment to, to get to. It's very, very cold, as I'm sure most of us know, and therefore wherever you go in space, you need some form of heat and power to, to, to keep systems, keep people uh, warm and energised. Um, traditionally, radioisotope power systems have been the, the source of that uh, heat and energy using the radioactive decay from, from an isotope. And a lot of missions have used these uh, since uh, the early 1960s. Uh, essentially, every mission that's gone uh, deep into space has had some form of radioisotope power system on board. Uh, virtually all the, the missions to Mars have had some form of uh, radioisotope system on board. And in fact, some of the uh, lunar missions, including every Apollo mission, uh, had a uh, radioisotope power system on board. Traditionally, they've all been powered using plutonium-238, which is an isotope of plutonium that creates a, a lot of heat. Um, but plutonium-238 is incredibly difficult and very, very expensive to make. In Europe, we have had the opportunity to make that in the past, in the 80s. Uh, but now in Europe, there is no uh, viable supply of that isotope. Uh, the only supplies that are currently being made are in uh, Russia and in America, and these are very limited. 
we were asked back in 2009 by European Space Agency to identify an alternative um, system and isotope for missions that they wanted to conduct into the, the, the solar system. And so uh, with our, our partners, uh, University of Leicester and others, we, we looked at systems that could do this and isotopes that could do this. And essentially you need a number of building blocks of that system. You need the isotopic material that gives you the heat. You need a method to convert that heat into some uh, electricity. Um, and then you need to bring those two elements together into a system that can be put on a very large firework and launched into space and be done safely. Um, all of those provides uh, a significant challenge and a significant amount of innovation. Around the, the fuel uh, source, um, as I mentioned, plutonium-238, if we had it available in Europe, I'm sure that would be our preferred isotope of choice. But with no plutonium-238 available, we had to look for an alternative. And uh, surprisingly, we found an alternative in uh, uh, the plutonium uh, stockpiles um, in the UK. Um, old um, or plutonium from civil uh, nuclear reactors that have been reprocessed and stored, uh, the older it gets, the more um, decay that uh, plutonium uh, undergoes. And one of the decay products is americium-241, has a 14-year half-life from the plutonium-241. And that isotope, americium-241, is very similar in properties to plutonium-238. It's a heat generating uh, alpha emitting uh, isotope. So it actually makes quite a good substitute for the plutonium-238. Because it's growing in as a decay product in, in stored plutonium, it's actually rel relatively accessible. Um, the material is, is uh, stored in cans and you've now got two different chemical uh, elements that you can chemically separate. The americium that grows in, however, is an impurity uh, in the plutonium. So by removing it, we actually take what is a waste, the americium that would end up being disposed of um, in a repository, and we turn it into something that can offer value. And in this case, offers value in terms of powering a spacecraft you know, to explore the, the solar system. The other part of the technology it required is the energy conversion. And here, University of Leicester have worked with, with others to develop um, a, a, a thermal electric system suitable for the temperature ranges that uh, we experience uh, on the system. You have a, a, the cold of space and you have the, the hot of the isotope. Therefore, you've got a delta T, and that allows you to drive uh, electrical conversion. Bringing those two elements together, again, was uh, part of the University of Leicester's team uh, objectives uh, to bring it together in a way that uh, both delivered a system that can provide the power, but uh, most importantly, was safe to launch. So a lot of the structure of the system uh, is, um, is safety systems uh, to deal with the the variety of potential accident scenarios that, that can occur. So the in, real innovation here is, is tanking what is a, a waste in the nuclear industry that the nuclear industry doesn't need, doesn't want, and turning it and repurposing it into something that uh, can provide real societal benefit in exploring the, the, the solar system, and potentially identifying um, um, interesting features, potentially even life on, on another planet. Now, I do have a, a, a short video to show. Um, uh, I've had difficulty with this in the past. I'm going to try a, 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 a setting change that hopefully will then give you the sound. If it doesn't, uh, at the end of the presentation, the ICME do have a copy of it and hopefully we'll be able to play it. So I'm going to turn off my microphone and uh, um, play the video. If somebody can just quickly let me know when it's starting to play, whether the sound is coming through. Thank you. There is no sound. We can see the video, but there is no sound. Okay, well, we will come back to that one at the end then. Um, I thought that setting change would, would alter that, but clearly it doesn't. Okay. Uh, oh, oh. Right. I will then go to, to acknowledgements. Um, 
as with any of this work, uh, any of these kind of projects, I need to firstly uh, recognise the contribution of funding from the European Space Agency and the uh, UK Space Agency. Uh, they've been uh, supporting this work since uh, 2009 um, and they're continuing to support this work with the objective of the, the first mission uh, being later this decade to, uh, as a lunar mission. Um, the University of Leicester team uh, uh, worked with European Thermodynamics uh, uh, for the, um, uh, the energy conversion system. We couldn't have done this work without the support of the Nuclear Decommissioning and Sellafield Limited that own and store the UK's civil plutonium stocks and very kindly let us access some of that material so that we could extract the americium. The Joint Research Centre in Karlsruhe, Germany, uh, have provided support on the pelleting and fuel form uh, activities uh, associated with that and producing a, a pellet structure that is robust. The National Nuclear Lab uh, actinide separations team up at Sellafield carried out the chemical separation and also carried out the work to um, demonstrate the system uh, uh, using uh, real americium to uh, generate electricity that was able to uh, light a light bulb. And then finally, the University of uh, Leicester research team under the uh, tutorage of Professor Richard Ambrosi um, supported the, the uh, system design and some of the fuel form uh, activities. So that was the end of my presentation. If you're able to uh, cut me off and uh, show the, the, the video, um, that would be very much appreciated. As space agencies around the world hunt for new power sources, the National Nuclear Laboratory has identified americium-241 as the fuel that will power future exploration for hundreds of years. We define ourselves by our big ideas, our light bulb moments, the discovery that nuclear waste from our past can become the fuel of our future. A team of scientists has separated americium from the plutonium stocks and safely turned waste into power. Hard work, sleepless nights, ideas powered by critique and analysis. An exact process that dissolves, separates and extracts these elements to create a source of energy that works in the darkest extremes of space. Then finally, breakthrough. of the future, operating far from sunlight where current technologies fade. We never give up on our insatiable drive to explore our solar system and beyond, to push the boundaries, to look further, search deeper. And opening up the potential to better understand the future of our people. Our beginning is already here, but our destiny Lies out there. Lies out there. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. So that's the end of Tim's presentation. So once again, we'll take a pause for questions. If you have one, please type it into the questions box. While we wait, don't forget that the winner of this award will automatically qualify as a finalist for our top prize, the Outstanding Achievement in Chemical and Process Engineering Award. Why not join us for that webinar too later this month? You can register at ichemy.org forward slash global awards. So we don't appear to have any questions. So thank you, Tim. We're going to move on. Next up, please welcome from Petronas Research, Fadli Hadana. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Salam. Uh, uh, very good evening. Um, my name is Fadli Hadana Rahman from Petronas Research. Today I would like to present on the world's first high gravity technology for ultra high CO2 separation from natural gas. Uh, with this, uh, we have some collaboration also with some uh, technology partner from China which is Beijing University of Technology. Um, uh, with our co-author is uh, Mr. Radim, Mr. Azrul, uh, Mr. Yazid, Mr. Azlan, Mr. Shazwan, Safwan, Ms. Zamzila, Ms. Amiza, Mr. Hamid, 
Mr. Shahril, Mr. Akram, Ms. Nor Faiza, Mr. Khaidi, and Ms. Nor Hayati. Okay, um, this is uh, meant for the innovative product category for under ICAMI Global Awards 2020. Okay, next. Okay, this is high CO2 fields around the world. Um, as you might see, the blue dots representing the hydrocarbon volume inside the high CO2 fields around the world. So uh, to unlock this hydrocarbon uh, resources, we need some technology that is sustainable for the future and also has the minimum impact to the climate change. So in here, uh, the arrows showing uh, Malaysian uh, uh, Okay, the problem statement. Uh, problem statement. Sorry. So the uh, normally the the cryogenic distillation column has a massive footprint. Uh, it has about thirty to forty meters of uh, column height, and then uh, normally it also has a higher weight due to tall column. And the material of packing and structure is very heavy, so it has. For offshore installation, normally has a higher capex, capital expenditure aspect, investment, uh, especially if you want to install for offshore application. So uh, we do have some uh, sustainability issue as well uh, due to the CO2 production and uh, CO2 storage. So in Petronas, we also uh, have some groups that is uh, currently developing on the CCUS uh, project in, in Petronas to resolving this, uh, this issue. Okay, next, on the uh, climate technology, what is the climate technology? Climate technology is referring to cryogenic miniaturization. It is a bulk CO2 separation technology that can reduce high CO2 up to 80% mole down to 20% mole. So, um, uh, it, called, it is uh, uh, utilizing a high gravity concept. Uh, it will improve the mass transfer and heat transfer in the column, reducing the packing volume and uh, column height and also column weight as well. So ultimately, it will reduce the capex for overall AGRU system, acid gas removal uh, system. And the outlet of CO2 uh, product from cryomine will be in liquid form and also high pressure, thus easier for re-injection uh, down down to the reservoir. Next slide. Sorry. So this is high gravity concept in crime. Uh, as you might see, the blue uh, color in here is the rotating part. In the middle is the shaft. Uh, there's some uh, packing connected to the shaft. So um, wait. Um, the feed coming from the from the side uh, will be in liquid and vapor form. The liquid will drop down to the uh, to the uh, reboiler, and the vapors will go back to the column. And the vapors from the feed will goes up to the upper column, upper packing, and then goes up to the sus gas. And in here, the target CO2 will be at the twenty percent more and the bottom outlet will be 99% more. So uh, we have also uh, target for the injection, which is the hydrocarbon loss uh, is very minimum uh, by utilizing this uh, kind of technology. Okay, cryomine technology also use a high gravity concept to enhance mass transfer in a cryogenic condition. This will reduce the size and weight as compared to conventional column. In the left hand, in the left side, uh, you will see the normal pack column. It, where it is very tall column. Uh, only use um, gravity environment uh, as we have 1G in here. Um, in on the right on the right hand side is a rotating pack bed, which is uh, a crimine we call uh, using the centrifugal acceleration instead of uh, gravity acceleration. So the packing will be uh, like. A very uh, very small but it, it has a uh, rotating parts and then the gravity environment is about uh, 200 to 300 uh, gravity uh, for this kind of application so we are combining a cryogenic distillation column with high gravity concept 
to produce this climbing uh, technology. Uh, we have done this uh, concept for offshore uh, application. So we have applied this uh, um, technology and then the, the, the target reduction from the column weight is about 50%. And then the column weight can be reduced by 30%. And ultimately, the capex can be reduced by 30%. This is for overall AGRU system or the acid gas removal system. So this is some example for other application uh, in, in China as well. Uh, to compare the original absorption tower uh, performing the same flow rate. So the, uh, the, the column height is about 33 meters. Uh, diameter about 1.2 meters uh, as compared to the small RPB unit uh, we call um, but maintaining the same uh, diameter but the column height reduced tremendously from the 33 meters down to 1.2 meters but still the same uh, feed flow rate uh, for this application. So we are utilizing this concept for the uh, climbing uh, for high CO2 application. So our uh, Petronas technology development journey, uh, we have started the ide ideation in 2013, uh, where we have some uh, draft of um, sketch and also uh, pattern. And then uh, we have some thermodynamic validation, mostly for binary and multi-component um, validation of thermodynamics. Uh, we also validate the uh, the EOS, uh, equation of state from SRK. And then we have some modified uh, the binary interaction parameters. And then later uh, in 2017, we have uh, our proof of concept. We have um, uh, the model for CFD and conduct some simulation. <clears throat> and then later uh, in 2018, we have uh, the first prototype that we have built for this uh, small scale, about 2.5 kilogram per hour flow rate. And then it was successfully uh, to conduct the separation uh, from 80% uh, down to 20%. And next, for the upscaling at offshore condition and also ready for commercialization. So this is uh, to share some uh, process flow diagram of the climbing column uh, and also the 3D model. So in here we have the, the in the middle is the um, uh, rotating uh, back back uh, climbing, and on the on the left hand side is the uh, um, feed cooler. Uh, on the top part is the condenser and reflux vessel. Okay, uh, this this just want to show the uh, climbing installation and uh, commissioning. We have uh, the column uh, the climbing column at the bottom uh, at the ground level. Uh, we have three level in here, and then the um, condenser and reflux vessel at the top, top uh, second level. So this is the insulation during the uh, commissioning uh, insulation. So we have several uh, type of insula insulation uh, for low temperature, and then uh, these pictures uh, with the uh, full insulation with uh, metal cladding as well. So for climbing separation performance, we have conducted several uh, st uh, studies uh, with some uh, gas. Um, this is the figure of 24 hours durability testing for 24 hours. Uh, feed gas containing about uh, 20, sorry, about 30% uh, methane and also 70% of CO2 in here in figure two, the blue uh, line. And then in the uh, sales gas, we can con we can obtain about uh, 70 to 80 percent, normally 80 percent of the methane, and about um, uh, CO2 about uh, 20 percent. So uh, in the bottom flow, uh, we get uh, hydrocarbon loss about uh, one to two percent, and the top at uh, 98 percent of CO2. Okay. So as compared with the um, uh, CO2 and methane uh, TX diagram at 45 bar, we have this um, um, bubble and dew point. So our target performance is about 80% of uh, methane at the top product and also um, uh, less than 5% of uh, methane at the bottom product, which is hydrocarbon loss. 
the red line is our um, the liquid uh, the sorry solid CO2 uh, so solid CO2 line. So currently we are still uh, far away from the E solid line. Okay, all the CO2 will be rejected back to reservoir, but currently Petronas is focusing on the other um, uh, CO2 as the value added product uh, for CO2 utilization as part of the CCUS program. So some of the CO2 uh, will be uh, will be used as the feedstock for other uh, other products. So not all CO2 will be reinjected back to the reservoir, um, but some will be uh, will be will be uh, utilized. So in conclusion, uh, climate technology is a proven technology for bulk CO2 separation from natural gas. Uh, the research has took uh, many years from ideation uh, to pilot plan because we have several stages according to the technology readiness level. So um, it involves uh, many engineering disciplines as well, uh, as well as process, mechanical, instrument, structural, and etc. Climbing technology uh, reduced the capex to unlock the hydrocarbon potential from high CO2 fields around the world. That's our, our main objective. Uh, and then to CO2 produced from climbing as well uh, will be in liquid form, thus enabling the more economical uh, CO2 injection back to reservoir for storage. Um, and then last uh, but not least is in line with Petronas' aspiration to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2050. So uh, that's all my presentation, but uh, I have some short video about uh, one minute. Maybe I can share with you. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, please let me know if you can hear or can see the video. Off maybe, off maybe. Webcam off. Yes, we can. The world is now faced with an utmost challenge. Climate change is causing temperatures to rise tremendously. To unlock these hydrocarbon resources, we need a technology that is sustainable for future and has a minimum impact to climate change. Conventional distillation column, normally associated with large footprint, high weight and ultimately high capex, hence not suitable for offshore application. Crimean is a CO2 separation technology that utilizes high gravity. It improves mass transfer and heat transfer in the column, thus reducing column height, column weight, and ultimately reducing the capex. Okay. Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe that's all my presentation. Okay, so we, we have, have any questions? Moment. Right. We don't appear to have any questions. So thank you, Fadley. We'll move on. Um, we have now reached our last presentation of the session. Representing Plastic Energy, please welcome Carlos Monreal.
Hi everyone. Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, Carlos Monreal, and I'm going to try to uh, show my screen. Uh, uh, let me see if I if place it. Are you seeing the uh, the presentation? Uh, at the moment, we can just see a blue screen. Okay, just a moment. I'm trying to see if I can't move to this. What about now? And uh, now we can see your desktop, so we're almost there. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, we can just see the uh, the wrong settings. So if you can just switch the display settings, it will be perfect. So where it says display settings on the top left, there should be a drop down. You can just choose. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So is the this is a uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, to keep uh, everyone awake. It's, uh, it's late uh, for the evening. And uh, this is a picture of one of the plants that we have uh, uh, operating that is uh, uh, recycling plastics and uh, is located in the south of Spain. It is, uh, if, uh, let me, I cannot move my presentation. Okay, so uh, we are producing something like about uh, today, uh, more than 1 million tons of plastics every day worldwide. I want to emphasize that this is really the uh, plastics are not really the, the problem. Uh, we keep talking the, uh, for many years that, uh, uh, that uh, plastics is a big concern, but really the uh, plastic has nothing to do with what we do and with the plastics once that we have used it to the point that uh, right now, this valuable material is that uh, we are only recycling uh, something like about 14% of the plastics uh, packaging that is uh, being produced worldwide, with uh, a similar percentage sent uh, to incineration and with about 40% going to landfilling. Uh, the, the problem that we have with this uh, low recycling rate that we have globally is that they, there are studies that they claim that they, more than 8 million tons of plastics end up into our oceans every single year. Everything they start to be uh, released uh, in the media and they particularly uh, starting about three years ago where uh, the social media start to be extremely aware of uh, what it was happening, what it is happening in, the, in different markets, particularly in Southeast Asia and developing markets that they, uh, with a situation that it was the, uh, uh, heavily uh, 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 in promoted and incentivized by the ban of uh, China to import a certain type of uh, low quality uh, recycled plastics into China, that they made uh, the European community or uh, USA, Japan, Australia to have to look uh, for alternative uh, places to divert uh, plastics from China to other regions, particularly Southeast Asia, creating a big problem on those regions because they didn't have the infrastructure that we have in other countries to be able to process those type of plastics. So mainly that kick off a different type of policies in different countries to try to improve the way that we manage uh, the waste plastics or the end-of-life plastics that cannot be mechanical recycled either through different type of policies 
or uh, commitments from uh, the different uh, companies that use plastics within their packaging. So chemical recycling, mainly uh, what it does is to, uh, is to provide a complementary solution to existing traditional and mechanical recycling solutions. Uh, currently, for the last 30 years, what we have been doing as a society is to follow the yellow uh, arrow. We have been uh, producing plastics, we have used it, and then sorted or collected, sorted, and then take it to mechanical recycling facilities that they were forced or they are forced to have to separate the plastics by type of polymer. And in most of the uh, uh, cases, they have to wash it and therefore they have to dry it. And that in order to produce uh, something that can be used a few more times. But as, as I said before, that represents really something like about 14% of all the plastics that are being used, are, uh, and everything else is mainly taken into the red arrow going to, to incineration in the north of Europe, or uh, landfilling in the south of Europe, or USA, or South Asia, with the problem that part of that is also going to is leakage to the environment, and this is what we are going to try to avoid by taking all those type of plastics that are not mechanical recycled and take it into a chemical recycling plant that could be able to process them and produce a value a liquid that could be used in our case as a feedstock by the petrochemical companies to produce new plastics but in, with feedstocks in substitution of fossil oil based feedstocks. Who is Plastic Energy? Is the, we have been developing the technology for the last uh, 10 years. We have uh, two plants operating in the south of Spain, uh, one of them since the 2015, the second one uh, since the uh, 2017. And they are operating real operations uh, with uh, more than uh, 300, 330 days per year. And uh, the technology is patented. And uh, we have been evolving from the beginning, five years ago, of uh, the concept of producing diesel out of the uh, end-of-life plastics into a, an output that to today we call it a plastic-to-plastic -plastic process, which is what we believe is what the market is demanding and uh, what is going to increase the circularity of the plastics. And uh, we are able to do this through a long-term partnerships that we have with the most important players, petrochemical companies uh, globally. I'm going to try to turn on a video that hopefully uh, we could be able to uh, to get to see. Is uh, and if you don't, if you cannot hear the video, please uh, uh, let, let, let me know or to try to uh, uh, turn it on at the end of the presentation. Humans have always developed technologies to improve the quality of living. Plastics have enabled us to reach space, have improved agricultural production and enabled food and water to be distributed in a more hygienic way. They've also revolutionized healthcare and helped to save lives every day. However, our lifestyle also generates serious problems due to the ways in which we use plastics. With a life cycle of less than 12 minutes, the plastics that we use and throw away every day are rarely recycled and end up piling up in landfills or in our oceans and rivers forever. It is estimated that our oceans hold in excess of 150 million tons of plastic and that almost 70% of the seafood we normally consume has traces of microplastics. If we continue in this direction, by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the sea and the situation on land will further worsen. How can we manage this plastic wave which threatens our planet's existence? Plastic Energy has been working to find a solution over the last 10 years. And today, we have good news to share. Thanks to a unique process, we've been able to recycle the plastics no one wants and which cannot be mechanically recycled to obtain taka oil. 
It's an oil which can be used to produce new plastics or alternative transport fuel with a low carbon footprint. This technology reduces fossil fuel consumption used to create virgin plastic. This is not science fiction, it's not a project or a dream. It's a reality which is already up and running 24-7, 365 days a year at our plants in Almería and Seville in Spain. It allows people to continue enjoying the advantages of plastic while minimizing its detrimental effect on the environment. This is a new hope for plastic recycling which we'd like to bring to the entire world and a process which has made us world leaders in the circular economy of non-mechanically recycled plastic. It is a great sign of hope that this mechanism has been found and surely there must be more solutions that the brains of scientists can produce that will help us with this appalling situation. We've created a new technology which is making a big change. A change which on a daily basis inspires and motivates our employees in London, Almeria, Seville, and which will enable us to jointly make a difference in a world where using plastic will no longer be a threat. A technology which will help us look after our cherished planet. Plastic energy. Technology to recycle our future. Can, can you see the presentation now, once again? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. So I hope that everyone uh, had an opportunity to have a cup of coffee. Is the, uh, so uh, our, the mission of plastic energy is really to reduce pollution and, uh, and by the, uh, improving the waste management uh, by, by diverting plastics, increasing recycling, but uh, with a particular focus only in flexible packaging that uh, in order to, to, to produce a high quality recycled content for food grade applications. We have uh, signed it with a, a global commitment with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in order to process uh, at least 300,000 tons of uh, end of life plastics that cannot be currently mechanically recycled. And we are working uh, towards that goal. The type of feed stocks or, uh, that we can process in a you can see it here in the uh, small picture. We do not have to separate by type of plastics. We can uh, process LDP, HDP, PP, and PS all together without any further separation. And, but we try to avoid and minimize the quantities of PET and PVC. As you can see in the picture, the, uh, pl the plastic is heavily contaminated with uh, uh, with food and other type of uh, materials, and then we process it and we produce uh, later on like a, a product that we call TAC oil, TAC, thermal anaerobic conversion oil, which is mainly like a recycled naphtha that can be used as a feedstock uh, by the petrochemical companies in, in their crackers. The conversion is uh, for every one ton of plastics is coming in, we, co we pro uh, produce something like about 850 liters of uh, tac oil. The process is very simple to uh, uh, explain it. Is the, uh, uh, we process the, uh, the feed stock coming to our plant through an extruder where we increase the temperature to about uh, 250 to 270 degrees. And then uh, we take it into uh, one of our reactors that is being heated up by the, uh, either the synthetic gas that we pro uh, produce with the pro within the process, or uh, at the beginning to, uh, turn it off, to turn it on, we need to uh, use natural gas. And then it goes through a contactor, distillation columns, and then we produce the liquids. In this process, something very important that they, they, uh, for everyone, everyone to know is that uh, we are uh, energy neutral, right after the extruder. So many people have the, uh, the belief that 
uh, these type of technologies are high energy uh, uh, consumers. However, we have to, uh, uh, to realize that after the, uh, more than the two years of uh, operating the plant, we were able to really properly use the synthetic gas produced on the process and be able to apply it to heat the furnaces and be able to avoid or minimize the external gas consumption on the process. So the only consumption that we have in our plant is coming from the electricity consumption of, of the extruder or the utilities associated to the process. But again, as we were talking in the video, this is not a, a, a dream. This is not a PowerPoint presentation. And this is really a reality where we are tra transforming this plastic waste into a very a demanded a, a, a product, the coil, that was presented already in Davos in 2019 uh, with a company, uh, with a petrochemical company, Savic, that uh, processed our pyrolysis oil and uh, produced a recycled food grade quality pellets that it was used by Unilever, Dimensions, Walkie Group, and Tupperware. There are many other examples, uh, but uh, during this year, in 2020, with other uh, converters, uh, Berry, that also uh, produced some products for Mondelez. The, one of the important things is that uh, uh, we can uh, 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 assure the traceability of the process, and that is the whole process is validated and uh, certified by ISCC plus, and uh, the quantities of uh, in the uh, of the how much material comes in and comes out is then uh, calculated with a mass balance type of approach that is commonly used in many other different industries. The the beauty of the whole process is that the equality of the nafta like type of uh, output that we produce uh, can replace traditional fossil fuels and are being used for full grade uh, uh, plastic packaging, which is the main market that we are addressing. More applications is the, uh, um, we just started uh, last year with uh, the Magnum taps in the selected countries in Europe. Now it's been uh, commercialized globally. Also the NORC packaging in all the cases, uh, fully certified with ISCC plus. And now recently, a uh, um, few weeks ago, it was a great initiative uh, led by the Tesco in the UK that uh, using uh, collecting the plastics uh, from, the, uh, from the different uh, shops across the UK, uh, we, uh, they were processed in our plants and then sold the uh, output to Savic that they, uh, was able to uh, produce the polymer that later on a uh, seal air was able to use in order to produce the packaging for Bradbury cheese. Critical is to, uh, also to address some of the concerns from the uh, different NGOs is what is the life cycle analysis of these type of processes. We have uh, just finalized a few weeks ago uh, an internal LC8 that it was conducted uh, by uh, Quantis uh, following the uh, ISO standards. And the key points of this uh, LC8 analysis are really that it is, uh, our process in plastic energy has a lower climate change impact than incineration with energy recovery, and also a lower climate change impact than virgin plastics. Our vision that uh, together with the mechanical recyclers, uh, we are going to be able to really reduce the environmental impact of plastics once that we have used them, and with a additional improvements that we are going to do in our plants, we are going to be able to even improve the current CO2 footprint of the process. Anyone that is interested in this uh, life cycle analysis, uh, feel, uh, please feel free, uh, feel free to uh, uh, download the report uh, from our webpage. We have uh, different plants. Is, uh, I'm going to uh, different uh, projects in the pipeline in different phases of construction with uh, a first project that is going to be alive in the, uh, in the Netherlands 
late 2022, uh, where SAVIC is going to be the, uh, the partner in that project. Then we are going to, uh, we are uh, also developing projects in France with Total, is uh, in the UK and uh, signed an agreement with Billy Dor to supply feeder stock to develop a, a project in the in Scotland. And uh, besides the two plants that we have in Spain, uh, in Almeria and Seville, we are going to expand the capacity of Seville, of the plant in Seville, and also build another plant in Tenerife. And plus the uh, other projects in Southeast Asia, where it's not only a question of managing plastics, but this reality is also improving the collection of plastics. But as an example, in the, in the city of Jakarta, with a similar population than London, only less than 40% of the waste is being collected. And you can imagine that really plastics is not the real problem. The, re the real problem is the collection of the waste in general. But hopefully, thanks to the plastics, Everybody is addressing the problem of this type of cities and it's going to help to improve the complete waste management and by the, uh, as a consequence also what is going to be done with plastics. In Malaysia, we have an agreement also with Petronas and, uh, and also with Ineos uh, as a partner in Europe. This is mainly the presentation that I have. Any information that is uh, uh, our web page can provide uh, additional input, additional uh, uh, videos and information about our process. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention today. Thank you, Carlos. So for the final time today, if you have a question, please type it into the questions box now and we'll just pause for a moment. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions. I think everybody wants to get to the moment we've all been waiting for, which is to reveal our winner. But before we do that, uh, let me thank all of our speakers today for sharing information about their work. I'm sure you'll agree, a diverse range of very, very interesting presentations. So let's start with our highly commended entries. And they are the entries from Dow Europe and Petronas Research. So well done to both of you. Um, but now for the winner, I'd like to hand back to Jason Babcox, David Irving. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the IKME 2020 Innovative Product Award sponsored by Dusan Babcock is Plastic Energy. You're muted, Matt. Thanks for pointing that out. Carlos, congratulations. How does it feel to be an ICME Award winner? Stunned, I think, is the answer. Um, Carlos, if you're still with us, it'd be great to have a word. Yes, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I was in uh, mute, sorry. I'm very pleased. I think I got nervous about the, the award and uh, very much appreciate it. It uh, has been a hell of a job for the complete team of the company. And uh, thank you very much uh, to you and the, the organization. Very much appreciate it. Well, thank you and well done to Plastic Energy. A big thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And of course, our sponsor, Dusan Babcock. If you've enjoyed today's webinar, don't forget, we've got plenty more still to come over the next week or so. Head over to icome.org forward slash global awards to find out what's still to come. But for now, that's all. So goodbye and congratulations to Plastic Energy, winner of the ICME 2020 Innovative Products Award. Thank you very much.